Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. This is the March 30th, 2021 uh, meeting of the House Bill 737 Environmental Subcommittee. Uh, my name is Chris Van Daisy, and I'm chairing the meeting. And before we begin, I will right to no announcements. All right. Um, and I'll read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting that we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. Um, and as chair of the subcommittee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the Governor's Emergency Order Number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the Governor's Emergency Order. In accordance with the Emergency Order, I am confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing GoToWebinar for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on go to webinar and via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website we have provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the house calendar we are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access if anyone has a problem please email amy russo her email address is amy.russo, R-O-U-S-S-E-A-U, -S -S -E at des.nh.gov, or call 603-848-1372. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, we will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance when each member states their presence. Please also state where they are and if anyone else is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Okay, so um, we'll begin with Mr. Ayotte. Present at my home office uh, by myself. Ms. Masper? Present in my home office by myself in Rye, New Hampshire. Mr. Wimsad? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, present in my home office in Concord. And I'm Chris Bandesi, and I am present at my Manchester office and by myself. And joining us as a speaker is um, MVD Commissioner Don Preventure. Don, you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Chris. I'm Don Preventure, um, Chair of the Merrimack Village District uh, Board of Commissioners, and I'm calling from my home office in Merrimack, New Hampshire. And are you by yourself? I am. Okay. Okay. Um, we do not have any subcommittee notes since it's been a very long time since we've been able to meet uh, to approve, and we can move directly. Uh, Mr. Preventure's uh, comments and discussion. Um, as you all recall, uh, some months ago, uh, Mr. Preventure was a speaker to the whole commission regarding um, efforts that were underway with MVD and the status of uh, granulated active carbon filtration. Um, around the same time, uh, I, I had noticed some comments that Mr. Preventure had made regarding concerns that he had about prospective development and uh, 
mitigation efforts that were going to potentially impact groundwater recharge. Um, in that particular instance, serving wells four and five, a recharge of wells four and five. Um, and it struck me as, as something that we might uh, look at more generally um, where, are, where there are uh, contaminated soils uh, or groundwater um, and how those, how development might affect those things going forward. So, um, Don, I'll turn it over to you to um, make comments on that subject or, or anything else that you feel we should be intending to. Don, I think you're yeah. Thanks, Chris. I figured that one out. Um, yeah, so last time I think I discussed, uh, one of the things I discussed was the, um, the project that is um, uh, right now being considered by the uh, Merrimack Planning Board uh, for development of property called the Flatley Parcels. And it's a number of parcels that are being considered for development of uh, research, research and development um, uh, office space, basically. Um, and the, the thing that I pointed out was that um, there is still forthcoming a remediation plan for, for groundwater and soil. Um, and that remediation plan still forthcoming and the timing of that associated with the development of the site, it, it could present some, uh, well, some concerns to MBD anyways. Um, but um, it's more in the timing of um, if this, the properties around St. Cobain are developed we're just concerned that it might hamper um, efforts related to the remediation of those properties. Um, and just a, just a couple things I wanted to point out. I had since then um, looked a little bit more closely at, it's a supplemental site investigation report uh, that was prepared for St. Cobain by Golder Associates. Uh, and that was submitted to the DES. It's dated October 14th, 2020. Um, and there's just a few pages in here that I would like to um, sort of just point out um, some of the items in here that I think are, are important. Um, looking on page, and I'll read it to you when I find it, page um, 63 of that report, it talks about um, the potential risk receptors and preliminary alternatives um, as far as the soil is concerned. And it discusses that um, there are still no soil standards. The, the standards of PFAS in the soil are related to like acute exposure, I believe, to you know human receptors that would be in contact with that soil. Um, but it doesn't really talk about the fact that that soil, if left in place, is going to continue to be a source of PFAS for groundwater contamination. Um, and I know they're talking about doing different things with that soil, either excavating it, removing it, or capping it. Um, but there, there's just a concern that there, it looks like, it looks to me like they're just concerned with the acute exposure and not really addressing the leaching potential of the PFAS coming out of that soil and continuing to be a persistent source of groundwater contamination of PFAS. Um, and on the same token, there's a discussion under um, groundwater uh, and stormwater that um, it that basically that Absent the state surface water standards for PFAS, no quantifiable risk has been identified associated with stormwater that would require remediation. Uh, but it does say, should state surface water quality standards be enacted um, and St. Cobain stormwater is identified as causing contributions of above standards in surface water, then uh, additional alternatives will be evaluated. So, um, I guess that that's kind of the 
couple things that I would like to ask, and, and I'm not sure, I know we have Mike on, I don't know if he understands the, um, the status of the surface water and soil standards, if that is being developed or if that is, um, is put on hold for some reason, but it kind of seems like this report sort of defers to the fact that there are no standards as not being able to quantify, obviously, if there's any violation of those standards because those standards don't exist. Um, but I don't know if the timing, I don't know if Mike, if you have an update on the timing of the soil or groundwater standards for PFAS. Sure, so I, I can't tell you when those would necessarily be you know, promulgated and go through rulemaking. Um, we are currently, and, and Joe's on the call here, um, USGS is working with the agency and conducting a statewide soil survey, um, which in large part is intended to, and, and in combination with that, some uh, laboratory studies and some field studies to try to develop the kind of information that we need to develop a soil standard, a, leach, a leaching based soil standard, not only for soil, but also look, working towards uh, doing so for biosolids because that's another area we're concerned about. So, I mean, that study is, uh, you know, being implemented, the field work for that study is ongoing right now. And we're, we're probably out to about spring of 22 um, before we would have, um, or summer of 22 before we would have the, a written report on that. Um, is that. Is that consistent with your understanding of the schedule, Joe? Um, I would say so, yep. Yeah. Um, so, so that is going to help inform that. Um, it's a complex issue. It's, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're trying to do this in a way that's most effective and protective, and we're looking at different soil types as well, so that makes it a little more complex. But um, that, that's where we're at on that. The surface water standard, uh, less certain to me what, you know, what kind of schedule we might be on for that. Um, you know, there, there's that's a difficult area that requires there's a lot of inputs that go into that and a lot of process that goes into it as well um you know we normally as we rely a lot on sort of primary research and work that epa does to help us develop surface water standards at the state level we're not getting that kind of contribution from epa right now so that's that's thwarted our efforts. So i, I don't really know what we're, what kind of schedule we might be on for a surface water standard Having said all that, um, you know, we have these uh, invest site investigation reports and supplemental reports from uh, Single Bain and Golder that are, that are under review right now. And, um, you know, whether there's a specific enforceable soil standard or a surface water standard, the fact remains that there's, there's no dispute that there's been a release of regulated contaminants, both from air emissions, as well as um, you know, more conventional release to the formation on the property. So as we, you know, those are still under review, but as we review those, we're gonna be looking to ensure that we have a robust remedy that addresses to the extent feasible um, any uh, existing contamination in groundwater right now, but also any future releases, either to groundwater through a soil leaching pathway or to surface water through various pathways. Okay. okay. Mindy. I think Mindy had a question. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe Mike could expand on this a little bit more. I know in response to SB 309, the state undertook an evaluation of uh, surface water standards in New Hampshire for PFAS. The conclusion was that the surface water standards should equal the MCLs. Um, and I don't know if the state is intending to take on rulemaking to make that happen or you know there was some reluctance to do some legislation this past fall in that area, but I just wanted the commission to be aware that that report is publicly available, um, and that was the conclusion of the report. Um, and the, the other thing about soil sampling, uh, soil soil issue is uh, so if something like this were to go forward, uh, in the past we had great concern over the moving of soil offsite and spreading the soil to other places, and so I just wanted to check in with you, Mike, on that, that if this were to go forward, if that would be something that the DES would restrict. You're talking about the flatly development? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's a difficult area. What, what we've done, with, you know, there's already, as you know, been some development on adjoining flatly parcels, some significant development. And, you know, the conversation we have with them was that while we don't have an enforceable specific numerical standard, 
um, we are generally aware that soils, you know, at, at certain levels of contamination pose a potential risk of impact through leaching. And under the current regulatory scheme, those soils, to the extent that they could have an adverse impact on groundwater, would be considered solid waste. So while they can be managed on the site and managed, you know, within the construct of the of the construction project, um, if they're removed from the site and brought for disposal somewhere or use elsewhere, they could be running afoul of, of a solid waste. Uh, you know, depending on the on the, the nature of the specific soils, they run the risk of basically unlawfully disposing of a solid waste. So there is some regulatory control there. It's a little more difficult than if you just have a straight up numerical standard. Um, but even in, in the absence of that, I mean, the, the reality is, is that we may set a specific standard, but if there are other potential impacts that a soil could have and it's moved off site, it could still be considered a solid waste. So it's a, it's a difficult, it's a complex area. The whole issue of you know, contaminated soils is difficult. Um, and like I say, we had pretty regular communications with, with Flatley about that. And I would anticipate we have similar conversations. Um, you know, if, if they do their work um, prior to us establishing a soil standard, then I think we'd probably have similar conversations with them about any new projects. Okay. Mr. Preventure, were you aware of the surface water report? No, I wasn't. Okay, I'll, I'll provide you a copy of it. Great, appreciate that. Um, yeah, so as, as far as the rest of the, um, you know, just looking at the um, the agenda and um, uh, the discussion about um, stormwater diversion and uh, other soil disturbances, um, it, it does sound, you know, again, referencing this report uh, from Golder, uh, it, it does seem like they're still doing some um, site investigation and that a remedial action plan, I believe that's what an RAP is, um, is, is still forthcoming. So that, that's good to know. They did mention in here that um, there's some discussion about alternatives that will be evaluated, um, include, including pumping and treating the groundwater or pumping the groundwater releasing it to the sewer system. I got to tell you, that's not going to fly in Merrimack. <laughs> MVD was denied the ability to backwash our um, brand new virgin granular activated carbon resin media from our um, treatment vessels. We're not allowed to backwash that into the sewer, even before it's been put online and absorbed any PFAS compounds. And the concern was that we would probably, the concern was that in case MBD would backwash those the filters and some of the um, carbon media could get dislodged and into the sewer system with the PFAS adsorbed to it. There was a, a concern that that could um, cause a positive detection in the, um, you know, in the biosolids down there. So. We, we were prevented from doing that. But some of the other remedial action plans that are discussed in here is like a, um, like sort of an underground um, gate where the groundwater would pass through and be remediated in the subsurface soils with some kind of a absorption media. Um, so I'm glad to see that. I wasn't aware of this report. I think uh, the last time I did my presentation um, but but certainly, you know, with respect to the recharge of the stormwater, I believe um, because of hazardous waste regulations that it's precluded to allow stormwater to be recharged on a contaminated site with the concern being you're going to exacerbate that contamination by putting more groundwater in the system. Um, but if one of the things they're doing here is considering or going to be considering pump and treat where they put some wells in, extract the groundwater, treat the groundwater, and then re-inject that groundwater. Um, I think it's feasible to also allow the injection of stormwater if you're going to be re-injecting the pumped and treated groundwater. Um, it, it turns out that um, mm -hmm. half of the site is still included within what's currently documented as the, the wellhead uh, protection area. 
uh, the Act for Recharge, Act for Protection District. Um, but wells four and five, based on a more recent pump test that was conducted several years ago, it looks like that aquifer recharge um, area, the wellhead protection area, is smaller than what was originally understood. So um, the, it may not be directly influencing wells four and five, the site. Um, however, from what I understand, that was that modeling was also based on an assumption that the Merrimack River was actually um, providing some amount of water into the aquifer. So that's a seasonal thing. If the if the river runs low, I'm not sure if that means the aquifer could reach out at a further distance to to derive its groundwater recharge. So it's sort of a dynamic thing, and, and I don't think we really understand that to the extent to be able to say definitively where the boundary of that aquifer uh, protection district really is. So um, that's really all I wanted to to say about that site and to, to, as a follow-up basically to our last conversation. Um, and thanks for your update, Mike. Um, that, that's good to know that, you know, it. I think we're I think we were expecting that the um, surface water standards were going to be done by now. I thought when the when the bill came out to create the the groundwater MCLs, I thought there was a um, provision in there that said that surface water MCLs were going to be done within a year following. And if that's the case, I'm assuming that's been delayed for some reason. Um, so you know, unfortunately, I, I just. When I read what I read before about the fact that the effects on surface water can't be quantified because there are no surface water standards, that kind of raised the red flag to me saying, that doesn't mean we should ignore that altogether, right? So, and, and I think you did mention that that's not being ignored. So I'm kind of happy to hear that. Um, so um, just moving on to other items, um, yeah, so MVD wells four and five, those are those are the two wells that were impacted um, by the St. Cobain air emissions. Those wells are located within the inner boundary of the groundwater management zone uh, that was identified and uh, between DES and St. Cobain. Uh, that treatment plant went online in October of um, uh, last year, 2020, and um, so so far the lead vessel has already experienced breakthrough of PFBA, which is a PFAS compound. Uh, it's not regulated in New Hampshire or anywhere in Massachusetts or even EPA or anything, but PFBA is always the first PFAS compound to break through carbon media just because of its molecular properties being a smaller molecule. Um, so that's already broken through the 50% sample cap of the first filter, and that happened um, within four months of being online. So based on those projections, it's looking like PFAS, PFBA is likely to break through probably in less than eight months. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, because obviously the, the settlement agreement with St. Cobain provided um, funding for operation and maintenance filter replacement at a two-year interval. But obviously that was based on the breakthrough of PFOA because the settlement agreement really only applies to PFOA and PFOS. However, um, when we pass warrant articles to treat our remaining four wells, not wells four and five, but wells two, three, seven, and eight, it was represented to the customers and the customers voted based on that representation that the expectation was to have essentially non-detectable PFAS, any PFAS compounds in MBD's water. Um, so based on that, we're, the commissioners are basically planning on changing the media whenever the first compound, the first PFAS compound breaks through. Um, and we kind of modeled that after what's going on in Hoosick Falls, New York, where the state 
of New York Department of Environmental Conservation issued a consent decree to um, St. Cobain in Honeywell for them to basically design, build, and operate that treatment plant. And uh, from our research on that, we found out that they are replacing, at St. Cobain's cost, they're replacing the carbon media on that plant whenever PFBA breaks through. And, and that's a pretty that's a pretty significant statement because PFBA is not really, it's not even regulated, yet the New York Department of Environmental Conservation has the authority to require that St. Cobain and Honeywell pay to replace that media upon breakthrough of that unregulated compound. Um, so, you know, we're kind of modeling that scenario in Merrimack and that is the current plan. Obviously, that's gonna require us to replace the media much more frequently. And we're looking at possibly on between six and eight months versus the two years that we would expect to get breakthrough for PFOA. Um, so, um, you know, th there's really not a lot we can do about that. Um, we've had some legal interpretations that um, suggested that the DES does have the authority in New Hampshire to impose um, certain restrictions similar to New York State, um, given the um, current regulations that we have. Uh, and unfortunately, it was explained to us that it was sort of a, a decision made, I believe, to not impose that authority for enforcement, even though it's prescribed that it's it's possible to have we, we, that we do have that authority in New Hampshire. Um, you know, so in hindsight, before our settlement agreement, maybe would have been the time to address that. Um, but you know we are where we are now. I, I don't understand how the settlement ag agreement precludes the authority of an existing state regulation. My my understanding is that that authority could still be imposed at any time and any date today, um, and it's a conscious decision to not impose that authority. And that's kind of leaving Merrimack Village District with the burden of treating um, the groundwater forever. And, and one of the things I wanted to point out is in the, the settlement agreement between um, DES and St. Cobain for the private wells, this has nothing to do with MVD's agreement. This is a separate settlement agreement between MVD and St. Cobain for private wells. There's a provision in there that says that St. Cobain is responsible for um, providing treatment and also maintenance, which means media replacement of all private well filters until such time as the future where the natural groundwater is consistently demonstrated to be below current MCLs at that time. So the DES did impose that authority in the private well agreement and it looks like no action was taken for MBD on the public well side. And that's sort of a, that's, that's a hard thing for us to understand why the dis disconnect between private wells and MVD wells. Um, and that agreement was reached basically a month before the settlement agreement with MBD and St. Cobain. So these things were kind of going on at the same time, yet, there's no connection between the two. And I'm not, I know, you know, Mike, I know you weren't part of those negotiations at the time. I wasn't either. I wasn't even on the board. I don't know if there were other things going on that led to the situation that we're in now, but, um, you know, we're, we're, there's, there's a lot of things that Merrimack Village District and our customers are looking at that are not consistent with the way MVD was um, not, advocated for in the same way that the private wells agreement includes that 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 type of advocation so um, i'd like to know more information about that why you know the private wells were treated a little different than the public wells um, i know the private well agreement also had provisions in there that st cobain was required to hook up 
some of the contaminated wells, private wells, to public water supplies like MVD. And I think we hooked up, I don't know what the count is now, but it's probably over 80 properties, I think, in Merrimack that private wells that were hooked up to MVD water. And the irony on that is if MVD did not hook up to those private wells, St. Gobain would have to pay for those private well filtration forever. But now that MVD is hooked up to that, St. Gobain's obligation is over and it's MVD's burden to treat water forever, to provide clean water to those contaminated private wells that were hooked up to our system because of St. Gobain's contamination. So we just feel like we've been put on the, um, in, in, a, in a bad situation that our customers are going to need to pay to remediate St. Gobain's contamination for hundreds of years. And that's completely unfair. And I don't think, I don't think anybody in their right mind in, in New Hampshire would think that that's a, that that was an intended uh, practice. And I'd, I'd like to know how that came about and what could be done to change that, because that seems like a significant injustice to the customers of MBD, in my opinion. Um, but that's, um, you know, that that's, Pretty much all I wanted to say. I, I think the other thing is the um, the last thing I'll just mention is um, in New Hampshire we are regulating four PFAS compounds and they're individual um, MCLs. So each of those compounds can go right up to the MCL, and collectively they're not being looked at collectively. I do a lot of work. I'm a, I'm a consulting engineer myself in the state of Massachusetts and. In Massachusetts, they're looking at, uh, they've regulated six PFAS compounds, and the individual level of each of those compounds doesn't matter. It's the, it's the sum, the accumulation sum of those six compounds. You add those six compounds together, and um, it includes the four that New Hampshire are regulated with two additional compounds. And if you add those up and they exceed 20 parts per trillion, then treatment is required. So it may very well be in New Hampshire, if we add up these four compounds, we could be well over the 20 limit, but still individually, we're not at that limit individually. So what's going on is the PFAS manufacturers and users are switching compounds as soon as they are detected in the environment before they reach levels that could be a problem they just switch to a different PFAS compound. And if we keep regulating these individual compounds individually and don't look at them as a class and don't add them together, we're never gonna catch up to them. They're always gonna be a step or two ahead. By the time we regulated PFOA and PFOS, that was already out of use for at least four or five years or even more as far as, I'm, as, far as I understand. Um, so that, that would be my, my recommendation is to if you want to look at uh, legislation to be considering something like Massachusetts is doing and looking at a group of PFAS compounds and adding them together because the literature from what I'm reading suggests and it's all new that's the problem is we got to wait a long time before we figure out the health effects but by the time we figure them out for one particular compound or two particular compounds the manufacturers have already moved on to the next compound so we're never going to catch up to them, and, and that's that's the concern here is we're being sort of outplayed by the, the manufacturers, um, and, and I don't think we're ever going to get an upper hand on this until that is looked at qualitatively, quantitatively from the, the combined um, PFAS class. So that that's really all I uh, wanted to bring out today in, in, uh, in my discussion. I don't know if you have any other questions or comments to address any of these comments that I made. Mindy. Go ahead, Mindy. So we attempted to do something similar at the time. Vermont was the first state to do what you were talking about in terms of sort of, you know, a top limit on the total PFAS, which now I think Vermont is similarly up to five or six at 20 parts per trillion total. Um, so I'm certainly a proponent of doing that, and thank you for saying that. Um, 
we did try to do that in 2017 and 2018 in the legislature, which was, uh, you know, not successful. We also um, attempted to re um, request that the state uh, look at regulation of this class as a separate class of chemicals. That was denied in a one page letter back to us, um, I think it was 2019. Uh, which I also can provide to you, but um, I noticed, which I haven't read yet, in this surface water um, report that I just forwarded to everyone, there was a section at the end talking about regulating as a class, which I haven't had time to review yet, but there's also a more recent, I think this is the 2019, late 2019 report for surface water, but I certainly agree with what you're saying, and it's because of the things that you raised in terms of, you know, the slipping of the some of these other compounds through the media also that would you know certainly uh, address your concerns on that as well and i agree it it it, it isn't fair for <laughs> for uh people to take on that um o and m cost uh in perpetuity so yeah so this is mike I, a couple of things to try to that's a lot to unpack there don <laughs> so um, the, the most recent thing you, you asked about, which Mindy was just commenting on, um, we, we did at the time that we were reviewing the science and the literature for establishing the standards for the four PFAS compounds, we did, our toxicologists did look at um, this issue of uh, combining them and in, in the, in the possibility and the appropriateness of issuing a combined standard. And uh, the, the science just did not support that at that point. And I, I, I'm not expert enough in the toxicology to explain to you why that is. I think it was related to somewhat different endpoints, health endpoints that were, that were the, the key drivers of setting the standards. Um, but that's where we're at. That's something we continue to be concerned about. We're interested in it. We have encouraged EPA um, to put some research dollars nationally into this very question. Um, and we'll continue to look at that. So it's something we're, we're receptive to and interested in, but at the time we set the standards, we were just not in a position, the science just wasn't there to do that from the perspective of the, of, uh, the work that we were doing. Uh, going back to your other concerns that you described about the agreement that MVD entered into with, um, with St. Cobain with respect to Wells 4 and 5, um, imp important to note that the settlement agreement that the state entered into with St. Cobain was really primarily intended to focus, as you, as you described, on how private wells would be, would be treated in the area. Um, it did not include uh, you know, any kind of settlement or provisions for MVD. MVD was doing that work on their own. They were certainly talking to DES staff, but they were, they were um, you know, holding those negotiations with St. Cobain and they entered into the agreement that they entered into I am not an attorney and I do not speak for the agency from a, as, a, as an attorney because I'm not one. So I'm gonna be really sort of reluctant to talk about that in detail. I'm concerned about what you're raising and I think that uh, to the extent the commission would like to explore those questions with the agency and with the Department of Justice, we'd certainly be happy to do that. But I don't think a you know a public meeting like this is a forum for doing that. And I wouldn't, I don't want to say anything that's going to, you know, uh, disadvantage MBD in any way. So I'm going to say very little. <laughs> I appreciate that. I would definitely uh, like to um, pursue that if that's possible. I just, I, I know our customers are asking us all the time. Um, and I, you know, if we need to raise rates because we're going to be changing the media more frequently at Wells 4 and 5, this we're going to need to explain why. And these are all questions that I've been asked by by our customers. So that, that's where a lot of it's coming from. Thanks. Question for me. Is PFBA one of the 20 chemicals that get uh, varieties that routinely gets tested for? Yeah, PFBA is included in the, the routine. I think we're up to 32 compounds, PF, PFAS compounds in the, in the standard lab tests that are done these days. Okay. Um, and and that's, that's the same thing in Hoosick Falls. That's the first compound that breaks through the, the carbon yeah. media. Um, so it, it's something that was expected, and it is definitely something we're seeing. Okay. 
and you said that was at month four for wells four and five. And you saw some breakthrough. What was that? I didn't quite hear. Was it, was it at the four month period uh, that wells four and five filtration was online that you saw some breakthrough? Yeah, so they went online in October of 2020, and the, it's already broken through 50% of the lead filter in mm -hmm. February. So you're looking at November, December, January, February. So less than four months, we're at 50%. So I would think in less than eight months, we're going to be at full breakthrough. Okay. And are PFOA and PFOS still at the non-detect level when those tests are coming back? Yeah, last I heard last month in February was that PFOA and PFOS have not been detected even in the 25% sample. Uh, so the, the vertical filters have samples at 25, 50, 75, and then 100%. Um, so we start tracking the, the moving of those chemicals through the filter. And um, still, like I said, PFOA had not been showed up in the 25% um, sample depth. Okay. And so for the other wells, seven and eight comma filtration comes online in 2022, is that? Uh, so right now, that's under construction, uh, well, seven and eight. That's in our um, treatment plan over in Hollis, New Hampshire. And um, that treatment plant currently has um, manganese green sand for iron and manganese removal. So we did an expansion to that plant to add two granular activated carbon filters. That is due to come online in the fall of this year. So that's already under construction. Um, and then we've got two other wells, wells two and three. And what's going on is uh, we are, uh, we just sent out to bid the design for the PFAS plant for well two. And we're gonna build a PFAS plant at well two. The intent was to uh, pipe well three over to well two. However, we're looking at another source instead of well three. So at well three, we've got iron and manganese considerations over there. Um, so that's, that was going to cost about $5 million to treat the iron and manganese because we have to remove iron and manganese first before we can put that water through a PFAS filter. So uh, we actually have a pending application in front of um, DES now. I'm not sure. It's a preliminary report for the, for the proposed well, well nine. We're looking at a new well. Um, preliminary test well results at well nine indicated that it doesn't have uh, elevated iron and manganese. So we're hoping we can avoid the $5 million price tag of iron and manganese treatment and just go straight into PFAS treatment like we're doing at well two and at well four and five. It's just right into PFAS treatment. There's no pretreatment from that. Um, so that that's the plan. Um, we've also got a little bit of elevated sodium and chloride. So that was another reason why at well three, we didn't want to commit the $5 million iron and manganese treatment cost and have that be at risk for sodium and chloride impacts. So we decided to look for a new well and this new well nine has low sodium chloride and iron and manganese. So hopefully that'll be online the summer of um, 2022 next year. Mike has a question. Yeah, I was, I was wondering what the PFAS data looked like for well nine. Do you, do you know that yet? Uh, I don't know the results. I don't know that we sampled that, but we're expecting that we're probably going to have something similar to either well two or well three because well nine is in between well two and well three. Uh, but the hydraulic characteristics of well nine look very favorable. I was told that they were pulling cobble size stones out of the bottom of the well 100 feet down and the specific <laughs> capacity was 300 gallons per minute per foot. So that means for every 300 gallons you pump, you're only dropping the well a foot in, in drawdown. So so the hydraulic capacity looks favorable there and uh, 
we're planning on conducting a pump test uh, probably in, in April once we get the approval, the preliminary report approval from, from DES, which we may have already got. I haven't got an update in a couple of weeks, so we might have already gotten that. And can you remind me what the PFAS numbers are for two and three? Uh, so well two, it's bouncing right around. The PFOA is really the only thing that's in violation in anywhere in Merrimack. Um, and that's bouncing right around eight to 12. It had been as high as 18 in the past. Um, and it's been as low as eight I mean, maybe even a little bit lower, but it seems to fluctuate. Uh, but more recently, it's been bouncing around just below that 12 MCL. Well, three has been consistently over 12, um, more close to around 18 or 20 pretty consistently. How about seven and eight? Yeah, so seven and eight, uh, those wells are pretty consistently over the 12 limit as well. Those are in the 20s typically, the low 20s of, of parts per trillion. Hmm. So my maybe rhetorical question would be why isn't St. Cobain providing bottled water to those customers? Yeah, I, I don't know. That that's when you look at the action that was done at wells four and five when when those were identified you know at the time i can't remember i don't think epa even had a limit um but subsequently at, at one point you know those wells four and five were were over a hundred at one point um so that was considered to be high enough you know uh, concern enough that bottled water was provided now the MCLs are lowered, and basically the rest of our wells are at or above that MCL of 12, and there's really no concern about, you know, providing bottled water to MBD customers. I mean, we even sent out our own notice to the public notifying them that the water they're drinking is out of compliance, um, but as far as the rules are, as we understand them, is that we uh when the mcls passed there was a year of compliance testing that needed to be done which i believe we're just finishing up and then only if the annual average exceeded the mcl at that point the water supplier needed to start preparing designing treatment i'm not even sure that there's a time frame a regulatory time frame that pfas treatment needs to be implemented and, and if you have updates on that, let me know because I might be speaking to something that might be um, outdated. But the last I heard is there's really no time frame on implementation of PFAS treatment when the levels are exceeded. So I don't know if you if you have it, if that's correct, if you have an update to that or anything to add, Mike. I don't know if you know or or Joe. Well, I'm certainly not the department expert on the drinking water rules. I can tell you, you're, you're right. There's a one year. Uh, you know, four, I should say four quarters of reporting for compliance that, that applies to public water systems. And then um, th there isn't, as I understand it, a specific date in the rules after non-compliance is determined when 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 uh, treatment has to be installed and operational. Generally, the, the idea is that once you know you're out of compliance, you need to take prompt steps to design, construct, and implement treatment. But obviously, as you know, as a water system operator, that's not something that that happens overnight, but that's uh, I, 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 you know, I, I may I may not have that completely a detailed answer for you, but but I think that's an accurate description of the of the rules. Yeah, the the timeline is pretty considerable since you you consider at Wells Four and Five a settlement agreement was uh, reached in March of um, 2018, and the plant just went online in 2021. So that was about, you know, three years between design, construction, and activation. So there's there's a pretty good time time frame in there. Yeah, and I think it depends too on the nature of the improvements you're going to make. I mean, I know that uh, in the case of Wells Four and Five, there were a lot of additional improvements to the overall treatment system that were made, in addition to just you know getting GAC in there for PFAS. So. Right. You know, the, the good news is you get a better system on the tail end of that. The, the bad news is it may take longer to get this treatment online. Right. Right. 
just seems to be another one of those inequitable things where private well owners who are waiting to have utility lines extended to them are getting bottled water, but Merrimack Village District customers who are waiting to get filtration are not getting bottled water, even though their water exceeds the standard. It is considerably more customers on the MBD system than there are private wells in Merrimack too. So that's that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Mindy, you had a comment, question? Uh, I, I think we've talked about this before, um, Don, but I can't remember if it was when you were in the present or not, that um, at PEAS they're using resin pre and post treatment to deal with the carbon to extend the life of the carbon. I don't know if that's something you have looked into or not in weighing, you know, the capital versus O&M expense of that system and may be something you should look at. And I wondered, um, especially when you talked about, well, two, I think it was in Hollis where there's a green sand uh, ion and manganese treatment. I wonder, and maybe Joe can weigh on this a tiny bit. I, I know there's something uh, or we are thinking that there's some sort of chemistry with iron possibly uh, that affects the PFAS. And I don't know if, you know, it would be interesting to see if pre and post that iron manganese sand treatment, would there be a lowering, a removal of PFAS or some sort of change to the PFAS um, that may act as a resin type of situation um, in that area. And Joe, I don't know if you're up to speed. I, I vaguely heard it a couple of weeks ago at EBC, some EBC seminar too about uh, this. So I, I don't know how the science has progressed on that, but there, it may be that the presence of the iron and the iron magnus treatment that you have to put on is, is going to help you a little bit. I don't know. I don't know the details of it. I've heard about it. We think it's true in soils too. So I, yeah. But, yeah. Um, I don't know the chemistry of it. Yeah, there's, there's certainly an interesting thing going on at Pease in the Site 8 area where with the former fire training area. Um, where there's exceptionally high levels of iron to the point where they had to reduce the treatment inf influent rates quite a bit and still I think are percent, you know, like 70% of the total maximum capacity because of the iron issue. So I think there is something about iron and, and association with PFAS that um, may be something to look into anyway. I don't think we're seeing that at well seven and eight in Hollis with the, um, the green sand plant that we have because from from what I understand is we're collecting raw water samples from those two wells, one from well seven, one from well eight. And then we're also collecting a PFAS sample uh, of the treated water when it passes through the green sand filters. And they're usually only off by maybe two PPT. So Darn. We're not really seeing like an accumulation in the iron residual or anything, mm. which is probably good because then the residuals that we're putting in our, our lagoon, our, our infiltration basins would have PFAS in it and we'd be sort of creating a hotspot there. So um, I don't think that's happening because the PFAS that's coming in the raw water seems to be consistent with what's going into the distribution system over there. So I hope whatever you're seeing over there isn't what we're going to end up seeing here in Merrimack. <laughs> um, but you mentioned the um, anion resin. Um, our consulting engineers uh, did study that initially. They, they, they haven't, we haven't looked at yet combining carbon with resin, but they did look at resin as a standalone treatment as well as GAC as a standalone treatment. Um, and one of the issues was uh, at wells four and five anyway, again, we've got elevated sodium and chloride and, and chloride is a problem um, for anion resin mm -hmm. to remove PFAS. Mm -hmm. I'm involved with that in, in some projects I'm working on in my business. And um, I know Purolite has a PFAS resin that works very well, but they say that they don't uh, guarantee anything if the chloride levels are over 200. And I think that's the case that we're seeing at wells four and five is the chlorides are that high. So I, I think it was decided to not use anion resin because of that. 
but I would like to actually try doing column tests on that resin because I would like to be able to see a way that we can filter out this PFBA mm -hmm. instead of having to change the carbon all you know yep. more frequently. So yep. that's something I did talk to our our consulting engineers, uh, Underwood engineers about, and it's just we've got so much stuff going on right now with everything we're doing. This is probably going to be something we're going to have to look at maybe in the near or not so you know distant future, hopefully. Mm. But that's a good point, and I know you've you've sent me some information on it in the past, so I appreciate that. Okay. Any other questions for Don? What you do, Don? Thank you for uh, being with us. It's been about an hour almost. Um, free to stay if you want. And okay. Appreciative of the information. And look for future updates. Mindy, you have. I guess just one thing in case Don is going to leave us. Um, we did receive a response to the last um, meeting uh, regarding the notifications within the consent decree area of private well owners just before this meeting from DES, and they are going to go back and uh, ensure that, you know, they're not applying a different criteria inside versus outside the consent decree area. So anyone within 500 feet of a, a contaminated well within the consent decree area should also be notified as they are outside. So that will, that's something you should know, Don. Yeah, thanks. I think I'll stick around. I'm, I'm interested in the next item on the agenda, so I'll listen for that one. Thanks. All right, Mike, do you have any updates for us? If we want to begin with private well testing. I know um, at, at one point DES had written um, with some concern about the adjacency requirement in the work plan for private well testing and, and felt that things should be rolled out a little bit differently. I, yeah, I'll tell you what, Chris, um, I have a very busy week. And I didn't see your agenda. I looked for it and I didn't see an agenda. So I didn't actually know that you had issued one. And I just heard Don reference an agenda and I haven't actually seen it. <laughs> I apologize if um, I think I sent you one. Uh, but the, you may well have. It's been a I very updates uh, well testing thermal oxidizer agreement and any other NHDES updates. Okay. Well, and, and I apologize. Your your microphone has got a rattle to it, and I sometimes have a hard time understanding you. So I understand you asked me to give an update, but you said something about adjacency or something but i didn't hear you clearly so could you repeat that um the go go to work plan um if there's a positive result requires testing of adjacent properties private private wells on adjacent properties with adjacent defined as within 60 feet of a lot line and, and that's causing a, a very slow rollout of testing and you know along with with those positives, there's a few spot tests sort of at the, the fringes of the outer boundary that early on look like hot spots, but they may not be hot spots. Mm -hmm. And you know, it makes municipal planning a little challenging because it's not clear whether it would be a short connection to an existing line or whether something more substantial has to be done. And uh, I read some NHDES comments that they would prefer a different approach rather than the adjacency requirement for rollout of private testing. So, sure. So, so there's a couple things going on there. So, so we have been uh, communicating with Saint Gobain um, recently regarding our concerns about that, about the you know the pace, and um, they have said that they think they can get their sampling done by the end of this calendar year. Um, we. We have talked to them and, and we're still trying to work this out, but I think there seems to be, there may be some willingness on their part to just use the 500 feet, which is a, it's two different things. One is notification, one is offering sampling. They're not the same thing, but, but uh, given that um, we will be implementing the 500 feet notifications to just a, consistent with that to actually, you know, identify wells for sampling on a 500 foot radius. So we're still working that out, but that's something that we're pursuing. 
on the issue of um, you know connecting people to water. Obviously, the, you know on the heels of this sampling that's going on, we believe there's going to be another very significant um, effort to extend water lines in in the, in the affected towns. And um, we've said to them, and I've reported on this in the, in the full commission meetings that. We are looking for them to try to identify places instead of doing this kind of in serial fashion. If there are locations where it's pretty clear that a presumptive remedy is to extend a water line, that we'd like them to start working on that right away. And we're still waiting for a formal response on from them on that. And uh, I, it's my understanding that we can expect to get one in the coming weeks. I mean, I think at some level, um, you know, the. They've probably been a little preoccupied. There's been an awful lot going on. So I think maybe some some responses to our requests have been a little bit delayed. And we're, we're trying to rev that up and get those responses in the door so we can move forward. So there's a lot of moving parts here right now, but um, you know, we're definitely our, our goal, our overarching goal is to get the sampling done as promptly as possible, identify where we're going to need to extend water lines to people. Or if there are places where that's just not feasible, there may be some locations where point of entry treatment units are a more appropriate and technically feasible solution. But to basically identify both of those those areas, both of those components of the remedy, and get them implemented as promptly as possible. Okay. As far as the uh, oxidizer goes, um, I think people have, have probably seen the news. There was a consent agreement that uh, DES entered into that will have um, uh, the facility and start getting that that oxidizer installed by this summer. I don't remember the exact date, but um, basically, um, and, and there's some additional provisions of that agreement that, that require some additional work as well. I, I'm not really prepared to talk about that for this mm -hmm. meeting, but, but I think that's been pretty widely reported on. All right, and anything else uh, on the subject, Mike, that's active? On, on which subject? Uh, the general subject. Uh, you know, we talked about surface water standards and soil standards uh, all over progress. Uh, the only thing I would say, I guess the other thing I would add is that we are, we've been aware, you know, with the pandemic and everything, you know, we had a pretty robust schedule for the first few years of this project of um public meetings and the pandemic kind of kind of put a put a slow that down and uh, we haven't had public meetings in the towns for some time so we're working um with towns to set up those meetings over the probably the next you know two months um we what we'd like to do is get a public meeting a virtual public meeting in each town um and then and, and the reason for that is you know at some level it's Maybe more efficient um, to you know to have one big meeting, but we don't think that works very well because it's such a big area, and every town has a somewhat unique circumstance. Um, and if you try to cover the whole area in one meeting, or even a couple of meetings, you, you don't really kind of drill down into the local community situations as much as we'd like to. So I think what we're going to do is try to hold an individual virtual public meeting in each town. Go ahead. Thanks, Chris. Um, I just remembered another question that um, some of our customers have been asking about. What, um, and maybe you can update. Uh, has anything, any new developments or anything new happened on um, the PFAS contamination in Amherst around TCI and uh, Hoey Drive? I've been asked that um, if there was going to be a groundwater management zone delineated in that region um, and, and if and when that's going to happen. I don't know if you know what the current status is of that. I haven't really heard an update for a year or so on that, so I didn't know sure. if there's anything yeah, no, that That's still very much an active project. And certainly, just as with St. Gobain, there will, there will be a, a, a groundwater management zone that is eventually fully you know, delineated. Um, I can't speak to that particular address you're talking about, or that street that you're talking about, but that's something that is still in progress. Mike, do you know if they were required and complied with the permits submittal and 
if they have to also put a thermal oxidizer on? Well, so so Amherst is no longer an operating oh, facility. It was, it was Manchester, a former okay. facility um, that that was that moved back in I want to say cheapers. I want to say it was like maybe two thousand six or something like that. Um, they, they moved their facility to Manchester. So the Manchester one, I think, was the one I was referring to. Then, do you happen to know sure. the status of that? Right. So the Manchester facility, um, I don't have a specific update on that. You know, we could, you know, it might be helpful to have maybe Kathy Bean from our air division come to a future meeting if you want to have a discussion about that that's more in depth. Um, they, they, we are, um, uh, we're, I don't remember exactly where it's at in terms of time, but there will be stack testing done at that facility. So I guess the only, the only other thing I would ask, um, if you have a, a thought at this point or an impression at this point, is uh, we, we're just getting a flood of London dairy data in, and I don't know if you have any impressions at this point about uh, what what's going to be done there. So yeah, London dairy we have we have pretty intensive work going on in London Dairy. And of course, a portion of London Dairy is within the consent decree area and Golder working for St. Cobain is doing sampling there. We are also, the agency, DES is doing a lot of sampling outside the consent decree boundary. Um, and we are finding a lot of detections above standards. So London Dairy is gonna certainly be an area of uh, really special attention and concern over the coming months. It already is, and it will be, it will continue to be. And London Dairy officials have reached out to us, and we're we're working closely with them to try to develop some solutions. All right, all right. Thank you. Um, if there are no other questions from Mike, um, next on the agenda, um, I had identification of topics for potential legislation or regulation. Um, more or less to get it on our radar because we're going to have to turn our attention to that pretty soon. So um, I guess we have some some food for thought from our discussion today. Um, but if there are, but it, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. Did you say turn your attention to what pretty soon? To to uh, proposing legislation and regulation just for oh, okay. our as a committee as a whole. Um, so I do want to get that on our radar and start our thinking about what we might be looking at. And we've had a couple of suggestions today. So if there's um, anything in particular people want to talk about under that heading, go right ahead. And if not, we will just move right along um, to scheduling our next meeting. Um, I don't know what our resources are or what, what the availability is. Hopefully, um, it will be as flexible as it was this time. Um, I would just ask generally this Tuesday afternoon work for people. Okay, all right. Um, and I'll get in touch with, with Amy. We'll look to have a meeting about a month from now to proceed our meeting of the whole commission. And um, if there is nothing further, we can adjourn. Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, Tuesday afternoons work pretty well for me. But this particular time slot works. I, I usually have a variety of types of meetings that, that can come up in early on Tuesday afternoons, but this one started at three and that works pretty well for me. Okay, and it seems to work for me as well looking ahead. So uh, we'll, we'll aim to do that, Joe. You're Thumbs up. Okay. So the 27th. Yeah. Don? Yes, I just wanted to say thanks for having me. If you ever in the future want me back, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, also wanted I, I want to thank the staff at DES. I think you guys have a great staff. I know, you know, I'm making comments, I'm trying to hold accountability, and I don't think the discrepancies that I'm mentioning have anything to do with the staff. I think the staff takes direction from above and um, I just want to make sure that 
I understand that the staff is doing all they can to help everything that they can do here. Uh, and, and MVD and Merrimack is appreciative of that. Um, so a, a lot of the concerns that I raise um, really, I don't think have anything to do with the staff there at MVD, at the DES. So I just wanna let you know that and I'm appreciative of everything that the staff does. Thanks. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, yeah, and I don't see any questions that have come to us from the general public. I don't think we need a motion to adjourn, so I will just uh, say meeting adjourned and, and thank you, Joe, for keeping notes. And uh, we'll be talking soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.